One thing I've always wanted to know, well, who is God? Where is God? What did he make me for? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? I used to have a lot of questions. And so today is just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of who is God and what's he up to? What on earth is God doing? This is the story of how the great I am. This was mentioned in the book of Exodus. And it talks about God who was revealing himself to Moses in a burning bush. It got Moses' attention. Remember, he was going to do some great things for Egypt. He's going to take the children of Israel out of there 40 years before. And they wouldn't have nothing to do with it. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? So he fled for his life because he had killed an Egyptian, hid him in the sand, and now it was known. So he went and lived on the backside of a desert for about 40 years. And then God. He's minding his own business, just watching sheep. He was next in line to be Pharaoh, but he threw it all away for the cause of Christ. But he felt like a failure. I done tried it. I ain't doing that again. Forty years later, God had to come to him and says, I uh, want you to do something for me. Sure, Lord, what do you want me to do? I want you to go back to Egypt. No, I ain't going. He gave God five reasons why he's not the man for the job. He said, if I go down there and they ask me, who sent you? What am I supposed to say? I don't even know who you are. He said, I am that I am. You just tell them that I am have sent you. Oh, that really helped a lot. He said, well, how do I know that you're really God? So he put on a few little tests. Anyway, God had to work with him, and he did, and he finally went. But it's the great I am. You'll notice that in the Gospel of John, it'll say seven times, I am the light, I am the way, and I am uh, the truth, and I am the bread of heaven. I am. He is all those I ams. And he said it one time, and everybody fell. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God. So God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So God wants his people to know him as bad as people want to know God. And so God simply states in the very first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Creating the heavens and the earth is something we can see. And the first thing we'll know, well, who made that? God says, I didn't. And before we try to prove God didn't do it, we ought to let God show you how he is the truth and that he's not lying. We ought to at least listen to somebody who claims to have been there, who was an eyewitness. We ought to give him that much before we say there is no God. Now remember, if there is no God, and you say that intelligently, you should be able to prove that, well, there is no God. Prove there is no God. See, everybody wants us to prove there's a God. Prove there is no God. To prove there is no God, why are we talking about God that doesn't exist? If there is a God, that means... If you say there isn't one, you ought to be able to be everywhere all at the same time because if there's anywhere you haven't been, could be where God is. True? If you want to prove there is no God, you need to know everything that is knowable because if there's anything you don't know, could be the knowledge of God. Therefore, you cannot intellectually say there is no God because you don't know everything and you haven't been everywhere all at the same time. So... If God is a spirit, you couldn't see him anyway. Now, I believe that there is a God. And I have no question, no doubts about that. I saw this picture of this eye on the Hubble. They took pictures of different things in space. And lo and behold, there's like a gigantic eye up in the sky. I used to tell the kids, there's an eye up on high watching you. I really didn't know it was. Not like, not, not like that. But who is God? And everybody wants to know who God is. 
So he says, all things in the book of John, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You see, God just states that there's the proof there's a God. What? Look at the heavens and the earth. Somebody made it. It did not create itself. Have you ever seen something create itself? You ever seen something come from nothing? It's illogical, as Spock would say. <coughs> there is a true and living God. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. Now, some of y'all are going to read that little statement I got up on there and a little comic. But people want to know, well, who is God? Where is God? Why does God talk to us? <laughs> well, reached out of heaven and says, here it is. So, if you have a Bible, see, God's already texted you. If you got a text, wouldn't you read it? Well, the Bible is God's. God texts us a, a message. And all he wants is to read it. And if you say, well, it's not true. Prove it's not true. He, he wrote 66 books. Surely you ought to be able to find a mistake in there somewhere. You don't find them in the Bible. They're not there. I had a man tell me one time, ah, it's just loaded with mistakes and contradictions. I says, okay, find me one. Well, it's just loaded. They're everywhere. Okay, find me one. He couldn't find one. He heard what everybody else has said. But the Bible is truly what it claims to be, the Word of God. Now, here in the Gospel of John, look there in verse 1. And note how it connects the Creator with the creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, that's eternal life, and the life was the light of men. <coughs> And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In other words, couldn't understand it. Couldn't figure it all out. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. See, God wants everybody, not just to believe that there is a God, but to believe what that God said and what that God did. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Talking about John the Baptist. He came and he preached about Jesus Christ, the light that was coming, that all would believe in him. Verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him. There's the creator. And he's talking about a world that he created. And the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So God wants everybody to come to him. But before you can come to him, he came to us. He came in the form of his son, who was a split in image of the father. You see, you can't see God because he's the spirit. So he took upon flesh. And that's called the son of God <coughs> when he came into the world. And notice verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. So if you want to know anything about God, you have to learn it through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God revealed. That's why you can have a thought, and the word tells you what's on the mind. Well, he is the word of God. I can't see God, which is the thought, but I can see the word, which is Christ in visible form. God took upon flesh for the purpose of dying because God is a, can't die. So he came into this world. And we've just celebrated this time of year, Christ and so forth, coming into the world. I don't believe most people understand what Christmas really is all about. But a lot of people... They don't really want to study the prophecy or the truth of the word. They hide their, well, their head in the sand. And that's what some people do. Now, you and I are different. We want to know the truth. But prophecy, prophecy was the eternal father's way of introducing the eternal son into the world. So God used prophecy in the Bible because nobody can accurately predict the future. Nobody. But God never misses. 
And he tells us what will happen in advance before it happens so that you and I would know because God says in uh, the book of Isaiah in chapter 48, he says, you're hard-headed and you're stiff-necked. Therefore, I'll tell you what's going to happen before it takes place so that you'll know <coughs> God did this. How to recognize the Messiah. You see, the Messiah was God's promise to the world. He was coming into this world. He was going to be born into this world. So he tells us in advance how you'll be able to recognize God's son. Now, get this. This is the first promise in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, And I will put enmity between thee, which is Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, if there was a snake on the ground here, and I was to take my heel and stomp its head, well, I would kill the snake, but I'd bruise my heel. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he was bruised for us, but he crushed the head of the serpent, which is Satan. He defeated Satan and is able to now to offer eternal life because, see, Satan got man to believe a lie, and the whole human race was ruined. Jesus Christ came and can give eternal life, therefore defeating Satan because no man could earn eternal life. No man could ever get to heaven because he's not perfect. And nothing that he could say or do could make him perfect. So Jesus Christ came in order to make a man perfect. Why? By taking away all of his sins. As though he never committed a sin. So the Bible says that he would take all the sin and put it upon his son, Jesus Christ, and he died for us. Therefore, our debt is paid. Now that's rushing a little bit, but that kind of gives you an overview. He says... Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. God talks about him having a son in the Old Testament. So this was mentioned in the book of Psalms a thousand years before Christ came. Because God used David to write most of the Psalms. So this is a verse about the son of God in advance. That God had a son. Then he makes this statement in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 4. He says, Who hath ascended up to heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So God has a name. <coughs> he is Jehovah. It's not Allah, it's Jehovah. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. He is the one true and living God. There are no ten gods and a hundred gods or a thousand gods. There's only one true and living God. And he's revealed himself. And he came into this world, God, that created the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came as a man. He lived among men. And they did not recognize him. They wished not who it was. Even though he had told in advance how he was going to come. They should have been able to recognize it. Clear the bell. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive. And bear a son shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is an untranslated Hebrew word. God with us. He is God with us. Who? This one that was going to be born. It's God. You see, Jesus is not just a good man, a good prophet, a good teacher. He's not a trailblazer like David, uh, David Crockett or Daniel Boone. This was the son of God. And he says that he's coming into this world. So the Messiah must be and would be a descendant of Abraham because God had made promises to Abraham. He says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and the seeds of many, but is of one, and through thy seed, which is Christ. See, God says, when I come into the world, there's going to be this seed line. He just said, to Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and on down the line. Until, lo and behold, there's going to be a, a virgin, a woman down the line, because Isaiah 7, 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. A woman down the road is going to have a child, but she's not going to have a husband who planted that seed in her. That seed was placed there by the Holy Spirit of God. 
That's why he says that holy thing shall be called the son of the highest, the son of God himself. Jesus Christ did not have a sinful nature. You and I are all born with a sinful nature. <clears throat> That's why God says you must be born again. But if you were born again with a sinful nature, it didn't help you any. So whenever you trust Christ as Savior, you are born again, born into God's family without a sinful nature. Because God becomes your father and your sinful nature does not exist in the father. So therefore, you and I can be born into God's family. The second birth has no sinful nature. That's why once you're a child of God, your new birth, you last forever. You're a child of God forever. Can never be undone. <clears throat> And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In other words, people can be blessed because one person was coming to the world. One person was going to die. One person was going to take all the sin for everybody and pay for the sins on all the people of all the world. One time. And then he was able to give his righteousness to everyone in the whole world that would believe that he died for them. So when you believe that he did it for you, then he gives you as a free gift everlasting life, and you get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for you. Now, that's good news. The Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> Back there in the book of Genesis in chapter 49, when Jacob is lying there on his deathbed, and he calls on all 12 sons, and he gives a prophecy concerning all 12 sons, but when he got to Judah, he says... Concerning Judah, he says, the one who is going to rule, the Messiah, is coming through the tribe of Judah. He said, the supper shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, the prince of peace, comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So this was mentioned a long time ago before Christ ever came. So he tells you exactly the man that's coming is going to be born of a virgin, and he's going to be of the tribe of Judah. So Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, had to be born of the tribe of Judah. And he was. In order to claim the throne of Israel. Just a coincidence. God says, because your hard head is stiff now. He said, I'm going to tell you all these things in advance. So that you'll know that whenever that happened. I told you so. I told you so. The scepter of the staff was held in the hand by a ruling monarch as an item of royal sovereignty or their authority. And it's talking about coming from the tribe of Judah. He would come from the house of David. In other words, there's a lot of families in this tribe, but it's got to come through one family, one family. So God made promises to a young boy named David, and God made some promises to him. He says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. In other words, somebody on down the line from your loins, one of your children, is going to produce the Messiah down the road. And he's going to be born of the right lineage. He has to be of the lineage of David. That's why when you read Luke chapter 2, and I remember Luke chapter 2, that Gary Stephens read that chapter last week. And that's a, a choice portion of scripture, the house and the lineage of David, right there in chapter 2 of the book of Luke. But this is what he's talking about. But he tells all this way in advance. This was the King David, a thousand years in advance. The Messiah would come from there. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So Jesus Christ came, but he was rejected and crucified. So without the king, there's no kingdom. But God promises that there is going to be the kingdom upon the earth and that the king is coming back. So when Christ came, he has two comings. One is a lamb and one is a lion. He came the first time as a lamb led to the slaughter to pay for the sins of the world. But he's coming back the next time as a lion, as the king. And he's going to set up his kingdom upon the earth. And what he promised to Israel... It will be Israel, and it will be their land and where they are. America is not Israel. We do not supplant the nation of Israel, and we can try any way we want to, and it doesn't matter how many people you listen to, they don't know the Bible. Now, 
The Messiah will be a prophet like Moses. The Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, him you, you shall hearken unto. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of John chapter 5. John and chapter 5. John chapter 5. Because under the law, everything had to be established in the mouth of two or more witnesses. So Christ himself could not testify for himself. <clears throat> he says, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. But he says, my testimony is not true. Look what he says here in verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of him of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Because you've got to have more than two or more. Who said, let me give you a couple other witnesses. You see there in verse 32? There is another there bear, that bears witness of me. Remember, God that created heaven and the earth, coming to the earth. And he says, and he looked just like a normal man. But he was a man who had never committed one sin. And he lived among them. And they didn't know who he was. He says, there's some who know who I am. He says, this is what they said. So in verse 32, there is another there bear, that bears witness of me. And I don't know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Because in chapter 1, he said, you asked John, who is he? And John says, I'm not, I'm not that prophet. He, he said, I, I'm, 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 I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. I, I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. But the Messiah comes after me. <coughs> he says, when Jesus came to him in chapter 1 and he was going to be baptized of him, he says, the Holy Spirit came upon him like in the form of a dove. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John told you who I was. John told you. He told you who I was. I'm the Messiah. Now notice what else he says. In verse 34, But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. In other words, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. If he's just a man, he can't save anybody. But if he's God who came into this world and took upon a physical body and paid for the sins of the world, and only thing you have to do to go to heaven is believe he did it for you. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. Do you have to go to church to go to heaven? No. Do you have to give me any money? No, you do not. Do you have to stop all of your sins to go to heaven? No, you don't. Do you have to promise to live good? No, you don't. Now, most people will not tell you what I'm telling you right now. And if they won't take and agree with what I'm saying, they ain't worth a quarter. They're lying to people. Salvation is free. It's a gift. Not because we deserve to go to heaven. Listen, I've never had a drink in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette. And I've never cussed, had a cuss word. Does that mean I deserve to go to heaven over somebody else who does all those things? No. In God's eyes, there's no difference. All have sinned. All have come short of God's perfection. I needed to trust Christ as my Savior just like the, 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 the lowest riffraff you can think of. All have sinned. There's no difference in God's eyes. You have to be perfect to go to heaven and nobody's perfect. We need a Savior. Look what he says there in verse 36. But I have another greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, and the Father hath sent me. Look at what I'm doing. When's the last time you saw somebody walking on water? Feeding 5,000 out of nowhere. Healing the sick. And making the lame to walk. And deaf to hear. And the blind to see. When's the last time you saw somebody doing all of that? He says, nobody can do those things. He says, but I did it. You ought to believe that I am God in the flesh. Look what I've done. Look what I'm doing. No other person can do all these things. And he says, I told you I was going to do this before I came here. Look what he says again in verse 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. 
Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abided in you. For whom he hath sent him ye believe not. I'm here. Hello. And they didn't believe him. Then he says, let me give you another witness. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. If you believe the scriptures, then you'll know who I am. But you don't believe the scripture because you don't know who I am. And you don't know my father. So he says here in verse 40, and you will not come unto me. Not that you could not. He says you will not. Everybody can be saved if they'll come to Christ. If they'll trust him as their savior. <clears throat> You'd be surprised how many churches are going to be packed today and next week and so forth. Of people who are trying to earn their way to heaven. Thinking they've got to go to church to go to heaven. And never trust Christ as Savior. Thinking that giving money, that's a good thing to do, but it won't get you to heaven. And it will not pay for one sin. Christ already paid for the sins of the world. Look what else he says. He says here in verse 40, And you will not come unto me that you might have life, eternal life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. For I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe? Which receive honor one of another. And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. In other words, you do what you do because you're just seeking approval from everybody else. You want other people to glorify you. He's talking to the leaders of Israel. The religious hypocrites. He says, you're not trying to please God. Jesus was not a sissy. And I don't like it when they try to draw a picture of Jesus as some little sissy. That would be a sissy that ran into that temple and took the cords and stuff and chased those people out of there and the animals and all. Jesus was a man's man. He's not a wimp. He was a carpenter. And most carpenters work with wood and they work and they're built. It wouldn't surprise me if he didn't look like James Hayslip back there. <laughs> look what else he says. In verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. He wrote of me. And this is that scripture that's mentioned back in the book of Exodus. And then the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 18. He wrote about this. He said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. <coughs> he wrote of me. This is one of the witnesses that God is using. It's written in the book. If you believe not his right, how are you going to believe my words? Because Jesus is the one who gave the word to them back there. It's the same God. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, there are some people who say, no, God doesn't want everybody saved. So he only sent his son to die just for a few people. And the rest of them can go to hell. Then they don't have a chance. And that's Calvinism. That's fatalistic predestination. It is not in the Bible. God so loved the world. That's everybody. Not just the elect. That's the world. He died on the cross for the sin of the whole world. And everyone who can come to Christ and will come to Christ can have eternal life. There's not a person in this room that God cannot save. He can save everybody if you'll trust him. And if you'll believe it, he'll give you eternal life. And you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. Wouldn't it be a shame to reject a free gift? As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. That's in the book of Isaiah. That when Jesus Christ came into the world, he was going to be beaten. They put a sack over his head and they'd take his fist and they'd beat him in the face. Who, who smiteth thee? Prophesy. Tell us who's smiting you. And then they plucked out his beard. I'd pull out one little hair. You ever pull out one little hair? I mean, to pull out the pain, what he went through. And he could have called 10,000 angels. I would have called a couple. Had them beat him up. But then, that's Yankee theology. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This is mentioned 700 years in advance in the book of Isaiah. Where God is going to take the sins of the world and put them upon his son. And his son would make this payment. So the Messiah will be a suffering servant. In other words, 
a man coming into this world. And he's going to do everything in obedience to the Father. He never displeased the Father. When God looked over the banister of heaven, he said, My son, who I am well pleased, because he did no wrong. He said nothing wrong, did nothing wrong. He was perfect, the Son of God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh. <laughs> Unto thee he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the fold of an ass. This is Isaiah chapter 9, almost 500 years before Christ ever came. Tell you now, this is how you're going to recognize him. Now, I mentioned this before, but let me just again. If I told you I want you to meet me down in Miami on Main Street, and what time? Well, it, you, you'll just know it's me. Okay, how many people are in Miami? You may have a problem recognizing me. But I'll have on a Navy outfit. Oh, that helps a lot. I'll have on a Navy outfit. So a ship comes in, and there's about, you know, 10,000, you know, servicemen in their white uniforms, all just the same. That didn't help too much, did it? But if I told you I'll be riding on a jackass backwards, playing a banjo and singing Yankee Doodle went to town, wouldn't you be able to recognize me if I give you enough details? Well, Jesus had enough details, about 300 of them, and there's no reason why anybody who knows the Bible cannot identify this person because God says they wist not who he was. They did not know the day of their visitation, the book of Luke in chapter 19. Jesus Christ came and visited the earth. Hello? And there was no room for him in the end. And now he says, I, I got room for you. He got us a big old place up there, a big old mansion. But this is prophetic. Behold the lamb. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. This is the description of Jesus Christ when he was rejected as a king and that lion became a lamb and died on that cross and paid for our sins. Now, the next day John sees him coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. See, this is what all this is about. This is really what Christmas is about. But at Christmas time, everybody wants to talk about all the gifts they got and the gifts they gave. Yeah, but, uh, what about Christ? What about Christ? Christ in Christmas, we're celebrating the birth of Christ. But why celebrate the birth of Christ and reject the man who died on the cross? They're the same one. They're the same one. The Messiah will have divine titles for his name. For unto us a child is born, but the Son was given. The Son has always been, but he came into this world. And so as a child, unto us a Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's the title of his name. How can this child that's going to be born be called the Mighty God? If he's not the mighty God. How can he be the everlasting father. Unless he has an everlasting son. And what is his name. And what is his son's name. If thou canst tell. And I will plant my son. Upon Mount Zion. The son. <clears throat> Philip said unto him Lord. Show us the father. And it suffices us. Now I, I don't believe. And this might be a little Yankee allergy. When I get to heaven and I finally see the throne, of, I don't know if I'm going to see three people up there. You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> or whether or not I'm only going to see Jesus Christ. He is the one that reveals the Father. He said, he that has seen me hath seen the Father. So I don't know if I'm going to see three. And I really don't care. I do want to see the Son. Because I believe the Son is the Father. He says, I and the Father are are one. And I believe that the Trinity revealed himself in three persons. There's only one God. But revealed himself in three persons. You say, you understand all that? No, I bet. I know when you talk about light, it comes different ways. And you can talk about H2O, water, you know, solid liquids and gases. 
And you talk about an egg, and it's uh, eggshell, and the yolk, and the, you know, the white, and but it's such a one. Yeah, but he's this all together. I mean, the shell is the egg, and the egg is the white, and the egg is the yolk. But I wouldn't want to eat just a shell, would you? No. Anyway, he said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know about God? Open this book and start reading about Jesus Christ. Study those prophecies. And you'll draw, it'll draw you right into it. It's kind of like it just sucks you right into the book. It's awesome. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judea, yet out of thee shall he come forth that is ruler in Israel, who's going forth have been from old to everlasting, or from everlasting. Jesus Christ never had a beginning. The one that's going to be born had no beginning, and he has no ending. He is God. He is the eternal great I am. The Messiah will die by being pierced in his hands and his feet. And this is mentioned in Psalms chapter 22. This is a thousand years before Christ ever came. Remember, prophecy is how the eternal father introduces his eternal son to the world. So this is God's introduction. This is how you'll know who I am and what I'm going to do for you because I'm going to die on a cross for you. He says, they pierced my hands and my feet. The Messiah will die by men piercing his hands and his feet because our sins were nailed to his cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. In other words, the Lord sees all. And so he took a piece of paper, maybe a scroll, and he wrote down all of Bob Gilbert's sins. <laughs> it was a scroll, 20 feet long. <laughs> and he wrote down all the things that God knows everything about everybody. Hey, he got one on you too. If every man shall give account of himself to God, every man has to give an account. And it won't matter what your friends say or think. It won't matter what your mother or dad says. It won't matter what your kids or grandkids say. Every individual must give an account of the God that created the heavens and the earth. And he says, all these things you've done. He gave us a holy law, placed the desire for perfection within us, and the knowledge that there is a God, and you can deny the evidence. But he's keeping all the facts he knows everything you've ever said, done, or thought. Ugh. And he took all those sins, made that list. When Christ died on the cross, this was nailed to his cross. He died in my place to pay for my sins. He came back from the dead, and he says, the only thing I want you to do is believe I did that for you. See, if I believe he did it for me, then I know I'm not going to hell to pay for my sins. I told somebody this the other day, because I say it often. I said, the reason that I can't go to hell is because I don't have any sins to pay for. And I can tell them, who do you think you are? <laughs> you little self-righteous Holy Joe. And they don't understand. I'm the one that admitted I'm a sinner, and I'm the one that admitted I can't save myself. By you not trusting Christ as your Savior, you're thinking you're better than everybody else. That's like slapping God in the face. I don't need you. I can do this on my own. Well, good luck. Christ paid for my sins. That's why you cannot know you're going to heaven till you know that you cannot go to hell. If there's any possibility that down the road you can go to hell, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand what trusting Christ as Savior means. You don't know what it means to be saved or born again. There are words you may use, but if you're not saved, you're not saved. If I'm saved from hell and I can't go there, if you can still go there, you're not saved from it. I am saved. <coughs> I cannot go to hell. Impossible. You see, I don't have any sins to pay for today. And I won't have any sense to pay for it tomorrow. 
and a year from now, I won't have any sins to pay for because Christ died for how many of my sins? All of them. You say, you don't deserve that. That's why God says, by grace are you saved. Grace means you don't deserve it. But in the back of most people's mind, we still think, oh, you've got to deserve it. If anybody ought to go to hell, it ought to be my mother-in-law. <laughs> because of how bad she is. And if there's anybody ought to go to heaven, I'll be all Aunt Susie. She'd give you the shirt off of her back. There ain't a better Christian in all the world. But has she trusted Christ? If she hasn't trusted Christ, she don't go. Doesn't matter who you are. If your mother hasn't trusted Christ as Savior, she don't go to heaven. Your love for her has nothing to do with it. Your love for your children have nothing to do with it. That's not going to keep them out of hell. The only thing that will keep any of them or anybody out of hell is trusting Christ as their Savior. If they don't do that, and there's a lot of people who trust the Lord, they know they're going to heaven. They got their little pinches inside the pearly gates, but let the rest of the world go to hell as far as they're concerned. They want to go on and just enjoy life. Not realize, well, I don't want to offend anybody. What's going to offend them whenever they die and go to hell and they knew you had eternal life and you wouldn't tell them? That bugged my mind all my life. And that's why I want to tell people how to go to heaven when they die. But look at this. Nailing it to his cross. Jesus paid part. Jesus paid part. I paid part myself. I don't think it goes like, only behave, only behave, all things are probable, only behave. Is that how that song goes? Only what? Believe. Only believe. And Jesus paid how much? All. Jesus paid it all. The Messiah will die by being pierced in his hands and his feet. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's in the Old Testament. This is before Christ ever came. He didn't just die on the cross. He died for you. He put all of your sins on him, paid for my sins. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, talking about Jesus Christ. Neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. His body came back from the dead. His body never saw corruption. And he promised that. He preached the resurrection. This is in Psalm 16. It's quoted in the book of Acts in chapter 2, referring to Jesus Christ. He is not here. He is risen. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. It's because, see, a lot of times the prophets in the Old Testament, they wrote what God told them to write. But they did not always understand it. Then they would try to study it Searching the difference between the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They couldn't put it together. Maybe there's two messiahs. No, there's only one, but he's coming twice. Prophesied of the grace that should come. In other words, because of this payment that he made, grace means I can give it to everybody without it costing them anything. And the only one thing you have to do is like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whosoever keep the Ten Commandments and go to the Calvary Community Church and pays 50% half of the lasting life. <laughs> Did I say anything wrong? Yeah. I just added to the scriptures is all. <clears throat> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whosoever believe. believe it. Should not perish. He won't go to hell. But have everlasting life. You go to heaven. So you can know it. And all the thing he has to do is, would you believe this? Would you believe it? Would you believe that God, who created the heavens and the earth, came into this world and died and paid for your sin? Would you believe that he did it for you? And the only thing you had to do is believe it. Accept that. See, the reason I'm not trying to earn my way to heaven is because I'm already going to heaven. I'm not trying to be justified. I already am justified. I'm not doing anything to be a child of God. I am a child of God. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. When? The moment you accept Christ as your Savior, the God that created the heavens and the earth promises you everlasting life, and he'll never cast you out and never lose you. That's the best news I've ever heard. And so they had to study the scriptures.
trying to understand what the Holy Spirit which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the suffering of the Christ and the glory that should follow. See, the first time he came, yes, they had the sufferings. The next time, the glory. And he's coming back just like he promised. You know, a lot can happen in just three days. On one day, the disciples were with the Lord, and lo and behold, he told them, he says, all of you will deny me. And he said, everybody, Lord, but me. That's what Peter said. And all of them denied the Lord. The officer, here's these 12 students who went to Bible college for three and a half years with Jesus as their teacher, and they failed their final exam. They failed. One says, I'm going fishing. The other says, I am too. They're going back to fishing. In other words, man, we really blew it. We followed this guy. Now he's dead. What are we going to do? And so we're hiding in an upper room out of fear, and the doors were locked. And Jesus wanted to get in, but the door was locked. He couldn't get in. No, he appeared, and lo and behold, they saw the Son of God. And Thomas says, I want to see the scars in your side. Now, I want to see those nail prints. And he showed it to him. And he says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. God. They knew it. Jesus knew who he was. Do you know who he was? Jesus is God. But lo and behold, three days later, something wonderful happened. He came back from the dead. A lot can happen in just three days. The sufferings of Christ, and all of a sudden, the glory that should follow. And he was caught up to meet God in heaven. And the Bible talks about, in the book of John in chapter 7, verse 39, on that great day of the feast, Jesus stood in Christ, and if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. But as yet, see, Christ had not yet been crucified. So there was no glory yet, but it's coming. Christ came back from the dead, and one of these days, we're going to get a glorified body to go with our new birth. I'm looking forward to it. One cross... Three nails, forgiven. On that one cross, he took all of your sins. He paid for them. And when you believe it, that he did it for you, that payment is put to your account. You're forgiven. Just as if you had never sinned in your life. And also for the rest of your life. The penalty had been paid. Now, there's natural consequences in our life for our disobedience, and God deals with that. But salvation, going to heaven, that is a gift. Totally free. Which way do I go? What should I believe in? A lot of people are confused because they're unsure, unclear, uh, disoriented, bewildered. Well, that's because any time you add more than just believe to the gospel, you've confused everybody. You've got to believe and join the church. That and, just open up a whole can of worms. That and, whatever you want to add, just a null grace. Grace means there's nothing for you to do. You see, believing is not a work. That is you deciding to trust someone else to save you. If you depend upon your works, that depends upon your performance. And God will not save any man who's trying to save himself. There's some people God cannot save because they won't trust him. But God will save every person who will trust him. Best news in all the world. And you'll be like the Father. You see, when you trust Christ as your Savior, you become a child of God and you're just like him. Your new birth. I saw that. I thought I liked that. I thought I'd put that for you. He said, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It says that you need to be like the Father. You can see that. Look up here. This hand right here represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. This is all the bad things that we do. And everybody does something wrong. All these bad things that we do, God calls them sins. We have all said, whatever it is, you did it. I thought, well, what sin? Well, whatever it is, you did it. Because God says all have. But God loves us. He hates our sin. But to pay for sin, is eternal separation from the Lord in a literal fire-burning hell. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven. To go to heaven, you have to be perfect, as righteous as God. 
and no one's perfect. Nobody's righteous. Now, God is. He's perfect. Heaven's perfect. But you and I, we can't get there because, see, God won't let sin in heaven. So now, how do we get rid of sin so I can get up there? God said, well, you've got to pay your debt. Well, okay, what's the debt? Eternal separation. Now, wait a minute. I want to go to heaven, but I've got to get rid of my sin. Okay, well, go get rid of your sin. You can come. Oh, what, well, how do I pay for it? Now, if it was just giving some money, okay, I got that. Just go to this church, okay, I got that. But God's eternal separation from God, <laughs> eternal death. Okay, you go pay for it. How do you ever get to heaven? You can't. You see, there's nothing for you to do except die. The only thing God accepts is death. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us. So you know God loves you. He loved you so much. He sent his son to pay for your sins. He came back from the dead. And the only thing he wanted you to do, is the only thing you can do, is will you believe he did it for you? When you believe he did it for you, he gives you as a free gift everlasting life. And if you don't believe it, God doesn't make anybody go to heaven. It's a choice. That made sense to me because there's, there's no tricks to it. There's no gimmick to it. I can't make you do anything. I can only present the truth. But whether you believe it or not, that's your choice. But there's a God in heaven who knows the mind of every individual. And he knows what you know. He knows what you understand. And he knows if you're hard-hearted or tender-hearted. He knows if you can believe or not believe. Your choice. But God knows. He wants you. He's not willing that any should perish. He says, you know the scripture. He says, but you will not come unto me that you might have life. You will not come. It's not that you can't. Well, I just can't believe that. Yes, you can. But you choose not to. Well, I just can't come to God. Yes, you can. You choose not to. You can. The only thing that's stopping you is you. The devil isn't stopping you. It's not your mother, your wife, your kids. Nothing's stopping you from trusting Christ. Only you. And you can handle that. You can choose to trust him. And if you'll believe it, God said he gives you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven whenever you die. And when you believe it, he says you can know that you have eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The only way you can know you have eternal life and know that you're going to heaven is it's got to be free. Because if it requires you to earn it, you don't know if you're going to earn it or not. And I can already guarantee you, you won't. Because it's a gift. It's totally free. 100%. It was the best news I ever heard. Not only do I know about God, now I know God. And he's more real to me than the clothes on my back. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, I think it's a good thing for you to do. It won't hurt you at all. And you'd be surprised how it seems like it lifts a load off of your shoulders. Because when you know that all my sins are forgiven, it's like I never did anything wrong. Now, you're, that doesn't mean your wife's going to forgive you. And if you didn't pay your taxes, that doesn't mean government's going to forgive you. But it, God does. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if you're here this morning, and you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust him right now? Trust in me, will you believe that what he did, he did it for you? This God that created the heavens and the earth loves you, wants you to have eternal life, and wants you to go to heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Why not right now, in the quietness of this moment, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Let me help you just a little bit. Why don't you just say something like this, Lord? I got questions, I got doubts. But with my limited knowledge, I know I've done things wrong. But I believe that when Jesus died, he died and paid for my sins. And I'm going to trust him right now as my Savior. I will accept that free gift of everlasting life. And friend, if you'll do just that much, God said he'd save you and give you eternal life. And you can know that when you get up to leave, you can say, I'm going to heaven because of Christ died paying for my sins. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I do it with heads bowed and eyes closed because I, I've been in your place and I, I don't like people putting me on the spot. <laughs> but this is between you and the Lord and myself. I want to know if what I said made sense to you. I want to have prayer for you. 
And I'd like for you to let me know that you're trusting Christ as your Savior this morning. If you've never done it before, but you'll do it right now. So, preacher, would you pray for me? Just lift your hand up very quickly. Put it right back down. Is there anyone at all? Anyone at all? Wait just a second. Anyone at all? If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. You're God's child. You're going to heaven when you die. But there's a lot of people that's never heard it. They don't know anything about it. Because you know it, tell somebody that's close to you. It might be a relative. It could be an immediate family. People where you work. Get them out under the sounds of the gospel. Invite people to come next Sunday, to be here, to hear, to understand. Maybe you don't know exactly how to tell them. We'll tell them. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for each person here, for those that are watching by internet. They follow right on the screen. They can just say, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. We're thankful for the many that have done just that, that let us know. We thank you for this day, for this time together of your word. We ask your blessings upon each person and ask your blessings upon the service tonight. In Christ's name we pray.